Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the final press conference here in Austin, Texas at the 230th meeting of the American Astronomical Society. I'm Rick Feinberg. I'm the press officer for the AAS, and I'm assisted this morning by my deputy press officer, Larry Marshall, who's monitoring our online webcast, and by my Astrobytes media intern, Benny Tsang, who will be handling the mic during the Q&A. Uh, if you have a cell phone, please silence it. There are two press releases going out to the AAS press list this morning, one from the Space Telescope and one from NRAO, the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, one for each of the two presentations this morning. In case this is your first AAS briefing, the way we do it is I will introduce the speakers and then turn it over to the first speaker, which will be Dr. Sahu, and then he will turn it over to the second speaker, Dr. Kent, and we'll save all the questions for the end. If you're on the webcast, you can queue up your questions using the online text chat feature. So I've entitled this morning's press conference Bending and Blending, which is not a particularly great pun, but it refers to the two unrelated topics that we'll hear about this morning. Um, one of them, uh, the first presentation, uh, is, being, uh, is about a paper that's being published online in Science Magazine this morning. Uh, and I thank the folks at Science, at the American Association for the Advancement of Science, for coordinating the online publication of this paper uh, to coincide with the press release uh, and the press conference. So we're going to hear two talks this morning, both of which are different but very interesting. Uh, the first will be about something that, uh, as you will see, has some relevance to the upcoming solar eclipse, the Great American Eclipse of August 21st, 2017 although it's a, uh, a truly out-of-this-world variant of the solar eclipse. And the second topic is on something that science journalists I know are very interested in, and that's visualization of data. Many of the illustrations and animations that appear um, along with press releases and with online articles about new discoveries in astronomy and astrophysics uh, are illustrated by uh, data visualizations that allow us to really uh, get a good handle on what's actually going on out there. So we're going to hear, uh, first presentation will be from uh, Dr. Kailash Sahu from the Space Telescope Science Institute, um, and then the second one will be from Dr. Brian Kent of the National Radio Astronomy Observatory. Before we begin, I just want to mention uh, for the press registrants, if you've signed up for the press dinner, we have a reservation at Lambert's Barbecue at 6.30 p.m. You can either meet us there or we'll walk over from the lobby at about 6.20 or so. Um, and the press tour to the UT campus where we'll visit the Harry Ransom Center uh, departs from the uh, pickup area right outside the lobby at 1.45. Okay, if you aren't already signed up for either of those, sorry it's too late, but I give you plenty of opportunities. All right, with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Sahu. And with any luck, there's Good. your cursor. Thanks. Beautiful. Thanks, Thanks Rick. <clears throat> so I'll talk today about the uh, recent work that we've done on relativistic deflection of background starlight by a nearby white dwarf. Uh, here are our team, the whole team, which uh, include people from uh, Space Telescope Science Institute, uh, people from Canada, UK, Penn State University, um, and, uh, and uh, University of Las Vegas. And, uh, University of Nevada at Las Vegas. <clears throat> okay, so I want to start with the gist of my talk, uh, which is given here. A century after Einstein postulated the general theory of relativity, we have now used the Hubble Space Telescope to measure the relativistic deflection um, by a nearby star. This is um, uh, illustrated here. There is there a white dwarf, um, as you would, as is shown here, a white dwarf, it passed by from here close to a background star, and as it came close by, then it deflected the light. The deflection has a characteristic is that it is always along the line joining the, the white dwarf and the star, and it's away from uh, the white dwarf, and it's inversely proportional to the separation. So as it comes by, it makes a little circle, uh, and, and it's a 
extremely small circle. The deflection is extremely small, as I will explain, uh, but we have measured it to measure the mass of a, of a white dwarf. So this white dwarf called Stein 2051b, which is a star close by, passed uh, close to a star, and we measured its mass. So that's the gist. <clears throat> so now to give a little bit of introduction, uh, so the Einstein's general theory of relativity was a, a, a fundamentally, um, a, it changed the fundamentals of our understanding. It literally changed the fabric of space-time. Uh, so it, it was necessary to test the theory, and Einstein himself postulated, he suggested a few tests, and one of the main tests was one of the crucial, which really confirmed the relativity, was the bending of light rays. If a light ray going past the sun during the solar eclipse, for example, then it would, he predicted that it would be deflected by 1.75 arc seconds. It was measured um, by a team led by Einstein, and it confirmed the relativity. <coughs> so, but if the same phenomenon, now that we have tested, the same phenomenon, the deflection, can be used to actually measure the mass of a star if we can see the deflection. The deflection is extremely small. Caused by a star would be at least a thousand times smaller than what Eddington measured. So, you know, say he measured about two arc seconds. This would be more like two milli arc seconds. To give you an illustration of what two milli arc seconds is, you know, if you have, um, let's say, in the, um, in New York, the uh, Empire State Building, there is a quarter, a U.S. quarter, and there is a firefly coming from one side to the to the other, and and the firefly is next to a bright light bulb, and your job from here is to detect the movement of the light from, uh, from one end to the other. That's two milli arc seconds. Two milli arc seconds, the US quarter from 1,500 miles away, that's two milli arc seconds. So it took 100 years to actually measure this, but uh, Hubble Space Telescope's uh, extremely high angular resolution allowed us to do this measurement. <clears throat> uh, so we, we proactively looked for this kind of events. We knew that this we should be able to do. We had the necessary expertise at Space Telescope Science Institute. We thought we should be able to do. Uh, so we looked for this kind of events. We searched for microlensing events caused by stars. So we took all the nearby high proper motion stars. Nearby means because the, if the star is nearby, then the deflection it would be relatively large, and the high proper motion means it, is, it has a better chance of actually coming in front of another background star. So we looked for, uh, we searched the trajectories of about 5,000 high proper motion stars in the, all the stars in the Leuten's half second catalog and projected their uh, positions forward using the proper motion and parallax uh, when we knew and then cross-correlated with the GSC, the Guide Star Catalog stars, to see such phenomenon. One particularly interesting event was this time 2051b, the, uh, the super, uh, the white dwarf at uh, 17 light years away. <clears throat> so why, why is this particular one interesting? Because the first, all stars with mass less than eight solar mass, they end their lives as white dwarfs. And when they end their lives as uh, white dwarfs, they, they are degenerate matter, and that there is a clear uh, physical theory which was advanced in 1935 by um, Chandrasekhar in his Nobel Prize winning theory he, uh, prediction. He said there should be a mass radius relation. The, as the mass increases, the radius should decrease. Um, so there's a very specific relation and that people have been using. But there are not too much confirmation of that particular theory because it's hard to measure actually the white dwarf's masses. In fact, so far, there are only three Three white dwarfs for which mass have been the mass radius both have been measured, and those are from binary motions. And the binary motion means means they are in binaries, so that means it's possible that there is some mass transfer has happened from one to the other, and so there is always a little debate that, okay, uh, is this a clean, the mass has changed because of this um, mass transfer or not, is this a really a confirmation? Uh, well, Stein 2051b actually also is a binary, but the component is a small mass star, which is 55, at least 55 astronomical units away, which means, 
it's more than almost double the distance between um, Earth and Pluto. So there is no way that there could be mass transfer between these two. So this, uh, so if we can measure star, that would be a clean, uh, relatively clean um, test for this mass radius relationship. Uh, <coughs> so. This Stein 2051b, again, this is 17 light years away. Its proper motion is 2.37 arc seconds per year. It has a companion, as I said. It's an M star, um, which is brighter by two magnitudes or so. Um, and the, I told that it's very hard. It's 55 AU away, so it's very hard to actually measure the mass. Um, just from binary motion. But people have tried using, using photographic plates taken over 100 years. Uh, people have tried to measure the mass from the orbital motion. And they came up with a mass which was, doesn't fit with any, any theory that we know. It came up with 0.5 solar mass. And if you want to make it consistent with this mass radius relation, then the mass comes out to be 0.5 solar mass. And that 0.5 solar mass means it has to have an iron core to make it consistent. And with the consistent with the mass radius relation. And iron core, nobody knows how to make an iron core white dwarf. Um, generally, iron core happens only in supernova explosions of higher mass stars, and nobody knows it. So it's physically becomes unrealistic. So, and not only that, then that mass would imply that the total age of the white dwarf is at least as, as much as the age of the universe itself, which is a bit of a problem. So. We tried to measure, we thought this is a very interesting one to measure its mass. Uh, so this is a, a picture of the very first image taken. Um, so this, the white dwarf is here when we took the first observation in 2013, October 1. The closest approach would be around 2014, March or so. So this is the first observation. Once we had our first observation, we could predict what, what the, uh, path would be taking the parallax and the proper motion into account. So this would be our predicted path. And now I'll show you the movie what actually we, what we actually observed. So the expected proper motion is, um, is this 2.37 um, arc seconds per year. So here is, um, so this is the first, uh, so this is 2013 itself. And then we'll see as it, um, Passes as, as time goes, what happens? Now, most people, you know, not just public, but most astronomers haven't actually ever seen real parallax, you know, the, through the parallax motion. You know that this is a phenomenon, but now you will see the first, many of you for the first time. So this is what happens. This is the Earth's motion actually makes the, the parallax motion. So you see 2013, as it goes, this follows exactly the predicted path as we predict from uh, uh, the proper motion and the Earth's motion around the sun. So as it came, um, it, would, uh, it passed very close to the background star and it got a deflection. Deflection itself is pretty tiny, but we measured it. Um, so the measurement, as I told already, the, you know, the, it's like measuring the motion of a little firefly next to a light bulb from 1,500 miles away. So it's not easy, but so here is a, an image. So this is what the, uh, the image uh, of the, the Hubble telescope image of a point source. This is nothing. There is no, this is not the white dwarf. This is actually the, the red dwarf. Now we'll see what happens when we see the white dwarf here. So the not, Okay, so this now, now you see, so this is the red dwarf, so there are now white dwarf, you see the image, now once we subtract the point, the point spread function, then the white dwarf position is pretty clear. So we measure that. And then, uh, so this is actually the, actually what we measure, the deflections. So, uh, so 2013 to 2015, so this is the deflection in y axis and in x axis, and so we would be, the model would be it would go here and then come back and go this way. And this is, the observations are precisely consistent with that. The only parameter that we can change is the mass. That's all we can change. So if, depending on the mass, the, so we, this, the deflection now tells us the mass. So we measured at, uh, at eight different epochs, out of which four were the best for, for measuring the deflection itself. The others were me, uh, used to measure the parallax and the motion of background stars and all that. All the background stars, of course, are, 
are steady. Um, they, are, they don't move, um, they don't show any such motion. <coughs> I mean, they have the proper motion which you type, they, which is linear with correct form. So once we know, so this, the, this tells us that the Einstein ring of this is 31.3 milliard seconds. That tells directly what the mass is. The mass is 0 0.675 solar mass. And this, once we put that on this mass radius relation, so the, I told you there have been three measurements so far. The other three are here. And now the, our other measurement, here, Stein 2051b, it, it should fall on this black curve here. And it falls right on that. So which, when I saw it, it's right exactly on here, I almost fell off my chair. Wow. It's, so it took a long time, but this is, this is, uh, this is a, really a confirmation of the theory that we have been using so far. And it's, of course, not an iron core. Iron core is here, which is very far from the iron core. Um, so this was, this was free from the iron box now. <clears throat> So, okay, that was my result. So the conclusion is that Stein 2051b passed very close to a background star in 2014, causing the astrometric microlensing. This is what we call the astrometric microlensing. The event was observed with HST at eight different epochs uh, to measure the astrometric deflection. This is the first ever astrometric deflection measurement by a Milky Way source beyond the solar system. And this is the first mass measurement through astrometric microlensing of an effectively isolated white dwarf. And these results are in excellent agreement with the physics of uh, electron degenerate matter. And I wanted to end with a little broader perspective. So you see, measuring the mass is very important. Measuring the mass, if for a star, the single most important thing for the star is, is its mass. If we know the mass, we know what its radius would be, um, how bright it would be, how long it will live, what will happen after it dies. Everything depends on the mass of the star. But we do not have very good handle on measuring the mass in a model independent way, only through binaries. Um, you know, the, but binaries, if it is closed binary, then it, there is other problems. So this at least gives another method to, de to determine the mass, a stellar mass, in a completely model independent way. So somebody gave yesterday a Twitter version. So I thought I, that was cute. So I came up with a Twitter version, which is a century after Einstein postulated general theory of relativity, bending of light by a white dwarf is used to determine its mass. Thank you. So good morning. So data visual uh, data in astronomy continues to increase in size and complexity. So telescopes like the Jansky Very Large Array in New Mexico and the Atacama Large Millimeter Array uh, in Chile continue to produce um, amazing large data sets, data sets like this one, which is a spectral data cube of a comet, a protoplanetary gap, also measured with ALMA, simulations like a Wolf Ray A star going around the galactic center, protoplanetary disks, of a Jupiter-sized planet in formation, and galaxy collisions. All these different kinds of data uh, produced by astronomers need to be visualized in a way that we can not only give the data to the public so they understand what we are doing, but also so that scientific research can explore their data in effective ways. So the data that you're going to see today and the visualizations are produced by one of my collaborators, Marie, um, Matthias Garate, as well as myself. I'm Brian Kent from the National Radio Astronomy Observatory in Charlottesville, Virginia. So let's talk a little bit about computing and visualization for astronomy. And I want to pose three questions. How do we facilitate data visualization in modern astronomy? Okay, we've got all these exciting experiments, observations, new telescope facilities coming online, both on the ground and in space. Um, what can we do with those, with those data? Uh, how do we educate uh, not only the public, but researchers and students uh, to use exciting uh, tools and techniques uh, with all the interesting software that we have? 
Uh, and how do we adapt graphics technology and software for research in astrophysics? Uh, astronomy uh, data is unique in that it is available generally to everybody and people in other fields, technical fields, engineering, software fields, are really excited to share those kinds of techniques and software packages uh, with us. So we can leverage techniques to begin um, handling these large data sets by using the actual data that comes from the telescopes and simulations. Uh, we often have uh, artists, you know, conceptual ideas of what something might look like in astronomy based on a, a relatively complex concept, but our data are of sufficient resolution um, and complexity now that we can actually use the real data to, uh, to show what it actually looks like. And we can use Python as our scripting language. Um, this is advantageous for astronomers. Uh, it's gained in popularity as a language. And um, uh, thing, projects like AstroPy have really taken off uh, and are well maintained and well supported by the community. And it's really, really a great uh, way to be able to automate some of the visualizations that you want to do. Um, one of the things that I've been working on is actually providing videos and tutorials uh, for students and researchers, researchers so that I can put these techniques in the hands of the astronomer uh, and they can start producing their own visualizations. So for graphics technology, well, I'm going to be talking a little bit about a software package called Blender. This is an open source uh, Python-based graphics package that we've adapted for use uh, in astronomy. This is what the interface looks like. This happens to show uh, Brent Tully's Cosmic Flows Galaxy database. So you're, so you're looking at 18,000 galaxies in 3D. The interface allows you to not only manipulate the data, load it in with Python, but also render out high quality 4K renderings and uh, produce really, really nice visualizations, not only for video, but as I'll show you, also in a panoramic view. So there are different kinds of data in astronomy. We have data cubes, typically from radio telescopes. We think of things in position, position, radio uh, right ascension, declination, and in frequency, showing the Doppler shifted uh, frequency in these cases. We have time series data sets, typically from simulations. Okay, galaxies colliding again, or protoplanetary uh, uh, formation disks. And typically we want to animate those kinds of data. And uh, that can be rather data intensive, but fortunately with uh, the Blender package, you can actually pipe some of your data rendering through your graphics processing unit, through your GPU, which is advantageous because it speeds up the time of your, of your rendering. We can also set a course and fly through a 3D catalog. So, what can people do to get started with this? Well, I've recently served as editor of a special focus issue published by the publications of the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, PASP, entitled Techniques and Methods for Astrophysical Data Visualization. This special issue consists of 14 peer-reviewed peer papers that are written by field experts in visualization. Uh, it's published by the journal, and the topics range from anything including interactive web content and applications to 3D printing. And a lot of these include 3D Blender applications as well. But one of the really interesting things that I want to convey to our uh, audience here and our listeners there today is the hardware um, that you can actually use to do data visualization. And it's a piece of hardware that everyone in this room has with them right now, and that's your phone, okay? So if you combine Blender to process with the Google Spatial Media module, you can actually have a data visualization that is platform and operating in system independent, works on iOS, works on Android, works on Mac, Linux, and Windows. And you've got this data viewer right in the palm of your hand, so why not put your data visualization into the hands of your users and your audience with something that they already use every single day? So I encourage people to try out some of the demos that I will have a link to at the end of the talk. Practice with these tutorials. Stop by my poster 201606 or load it onto uh, one of our fantastic iPoster kiosks. Uh, talk to me about new data visualization scenarios, and I've been able to do this at this conference, talking to especially a lot of the students of what they actually want to be able to do with their data, uh, both the technical challenges and what, the, what they want to get out of their science. And I also have a book that's available uh, 
published by our partners at IOP, so that's booth number 23. Uh, the nice thing about this book, it's part of the IOP Concise Physics series, so it's available both as a hard copy and as a digital copy. You can put it on your Kindle. Uh, and one of the things that IOP really wants to do with books in the Concise Physics series is to have uh, media content that is available to authors. So there's a companion website where you have video tutorials that also guide you through the book. So please check that out at IOP Science. So in conclusion, walking around the meeting and talking to people, I'm very encouraged and excited by a lot of the astronomical data uh, and scientific results that we see here, not only at this AAS, but all the other AAS meetings. And I think there's a lot of potential for uh, creating great visual, uh, data visualizations um, in astronomy. And uh, I thank you for allowing, that, you to, uh, allowing me to share that with you today. Uh, so please check some of these things out. Uh, my Twitter uh, handle is VizAstro and my YouTube is Visualize Astronomy. So thank you very much. Thank you both. Is this your iPad? It is, thanks. All right, we're gonna move into the question and answer period now. Uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand and wait for the microphone so that the people online will be able to hear your question. If you're on the text chat, or if you're online on the webcast, please use the text chat to queue up questions for Larry and he'll relay them to us in a few minutes. Okay, we'll start down here. Please remember to identify yourself and tell us who you write for. Uh, Martin Radcliffe, freelance, a question for Brian. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> this uh, connects with a lot of things I've been working on recently, um, but I'm curious if you've heard of um, Data to Dome, uh, which is a program developed by the International Planetarium Society and ESO to take visual data and astronomical data from you know, a laptop or a phone into a hemispherical image in a planetarium. So a number of theaters have their own rendering system to process a lot of this uh, for researchers parallel to the theater system. So your stuff is absolutely jiving with that opportunity. I wonder if you're experimenting with any, you didn't mention hemispherical cameras. I'm wondering if you're experimenting with that. Right. So. That, that's a really, really great question. Thank you. Uh, one of the things that uh, I've done, especially with the, the uh, mobile phone uh, development, is that is you know I encourage everyone to try it. Is it actually is a spherical projection? So you can you know, you can use the accelerometer in your phone and move your phone around and actually view the data. So it's actually already geared towards a, 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 a hemispherical projection and would work quite well with that. The the example that. I have, and I think I have five multi-wavelength examples um, on my link there, uh, infrared, 21 centimeter, low frequency radio, optical, um, is that they're all uh, sky maps. Um, the, the, the single 3D example that I have is, is one again with the Cosmic Flows Galaxy Catalog, and that's a little bit different because you're actually moving through the data, but that's why I'm interested in sharing this with astronomers is because there's no one-fits-all solution. Typically, when people do a data visualization, it works for their particular example, but I want it to work for many different kinds of astronomical data, especially with what we see in planetariums. That's, that's a target audience. Other questions here in the room? Hey, we'll have one down here in front with Steve. Steve Marin, freelance in Harvard University Press. For Kailash, the obvious question is, is there anything else Hubble can do along this line in its remaining life? What about JWST? Does that open up uh, lower mass white dwarfs or even red dwarfs or brown dwarfs? Um, I'm, I'm sure, yes. So the, uh, the, we ourselves, I am actually following another one. Proxima Centauri happens to be passing close to another star. Uh, um, so we are measuring that. And that program, is, it's, it's an ongoing program. So look out for results for, from Proxima Centauri. We are observing that there are observers, but we are still waiting for two or three more observations, uh, so it will end by next year. So there are several such uh, from events, um, uh, and um, so we are following a few, but there are many, and in fact, as you go with higher accuracy, such as JWST, then you can, as you said, you can go to lower mass, white dwarfs. Uh, there is a combination of how far the object is and how massive it is. If it is close by, then Proxima Centauri is a very 
close by, but very low mass star, and we can observe because it's close by. Um, but if it is farther away, then we, you need higher resolution. And so Gaia, JWST, even ground-based telescopes uh, with proper laser guiding system may be able to do. So this is kind of open shape, new area you know, mm. for such research. Down here. Farhanu Hassan, Reed College. Uh, my question's for Kailas. Um So I just want to confirm if this is the first conclusive evidence for the um, white dwarf theory or if this is the most conclusive evidence. Um, I wouldn't say this is the only uh, conclusive. So as I said, there, have, there are three other uh, systems those are also in binaries, and for which this uh, the, it falls on the mass radius relationship. Uh, some are more close. The binary system is more close than others. Sirius B, for example, this is uh, you know roughly of the order of 15 or 20 AU, and that's. Um, uh, People, some people claim, well, okay, there might have been some at the, uh, when it became a red giant, there might have been a, some mass transfer, but most people agree probably it's not. So, uh, so if you take that, then probably the, that measurement was also a confirmation, but this is a very clean measurement in the sense this is, this is the closest that it comes to is 55. It's 55 where you as it appears on the sky, they actually is much further because the, the line of sight actually separation is much larger. The orbit that we know because the orbit, the, or, the orbital period is more than 3,000 years. So, um, so this is a very clean measurement. Do we have any questions online? Yes, we have one question from, uh, for Dr. Sahu from Irene Klotz at Reuters. Uh, how does 0.675 solar masses Fit with models of white dwarf age and core composition. Um, so, uh, one of the plots that I showed. So, this uh, this fits with the radius for this uh, particular white dwarf. We know the distance. We know uh, the luminosity. We know the temperature. So, we know the radius, right? So, then we, when we measure the mass, we put on this mass radius relationship. Uh, it fits with a helium carbon core composition, which is the normal uh, composition expected for a white dwarf, and it fits right on. So it, it's consistent with the theory uh, as expected. One more. And Go I have a question, there. Larry Marshall, uh, Deputy Press Officer. Um, uh, I take it then that this, uh, that this uh, uh, method you use uh, is dependent only on the mass of the object, not its density. Can it be used with other uh, other types of stars? Yes, it's uh, so. It only depends on the mass, and of course, it also depends on the distance. But distance usually we can measure through the parallax. Uh, uh, so it de it depends on three things: one, the mass of the star, the distance to the lens, and distance to the source. The distance to the source actually. You pretty much you can say it's at infinity. So it's most crucially, it depends on two things, the distance and the mass. So the distance you can measure from the parallax and the mass. So it can be used for any um, neutron star, black hole, um, black hole if, if it happens to, you know, in fact, we do have a program to detect uh, astrometric microlensing signals from black holes, but that's a whole different subject. But so you can anything, um, neutron stars, white dwarfs, normal stars, uh, um, anything you, you can use that same technique. Even single high mass stars too. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So it sounds to me like it's a it's a a new way of measuring masses of stars that's not dependent on there being in binary systems, which has been our traditional approach. Right. So. It's actually basically a new tool. Okay. Yeah. But one, one last question with regard to that. What kind of errors do you expect for things like this? Though? So that depends on, um, so in this particular case, the error was more like 7%. Um, but their error, uh, if you can, this was the very first time that we observed. And this is, it was not sure whether we will be able to do it or not. If you had, if you had more measurements, more epochs, then the error could have been less even. Um, so the three, four, two, three, four percent is, uh, is, is possible. Yeah. 
Any other questions here in the room? Back to Martin. I'm uh, speculating again on uh, Martin Ratcliffe Freelance uh, on other potential targets um, and wondering if the brightness is um, uh, too much of a problem. So, for example, Sirius has a white dwarf companion, but Sirius is awfully bright for Hubble. Is that a, it's only eight light years away. Is that a potential target um, with this method? Yes and no. So what happens is um, Sirius is very bright, that's true. But well, if the Sirius is so close by that the Einstein ring is huge, it's, uh, you know, it's 10 times larger. So that means even if the, the background star is much farther away, you would still see the deflection. It's like sun, for example, the radius, the, the other side, the, the, the star was, what, 30 arc minutes away, and you could still see the deflection of, of two arc seconds. So as it comes close by, the Einstein becomes, ring becomes larger. This series is much closer, so the Einstein ring becomes larger. So that means you can observe the deflection even if it is far away. So Sirius is bright, but, but the other one could, can be far away and you can still measure. So, yes. Martin, were you referring to the mass of Sirius itself or its white dwarf? I mean, which, which were you thinking would be the deflecting source? Well, that's, I guess, as I was thinking about it, of course, it's in a binary system, so we have a pretty good handle on the mass. So, so what I meant was, of But course, I was really looking at, because there's a white dwarf there, right, can right, you right. get the white dwarf and see it's deflecting? Right, right. So the same, I was, I was thinking of uh, the white dwarf only. So the white dwarf, now since it is a companion of Sirius, the white dwarf, which is now, you know, six seconds away from Sirius, the, that white dwarf, since it's close by, it has a much larger Einstein ring. Mm -hmm. So it can be you know, far away from the white dwarf. Or, so that's the idea. So. <laughs> Any other questions here? Larry? Um, n nothing else from the web. Okay. I just had one other question um, of, uh, from my, uh, myself. Um, you, if, to do this solution, you assume that the star moves, not the, uh, that, that the star in question moves, not the, uh, not the background stars. Uh, no, we so we observe it. Yeah, that you, you are coming to the nitty-gritty details here, which is so. We, <laughs> so the every star in the sky, you know, close by stars, they with HST's resolution, actually they move um, pretty much um, all the stars in the in the Gaia. So, so in this particular one. We observe it well before the, the actual event, well after, to make sure whether it is, it is in the same position or has it moved. In this particular one, actually, it does move. It moves by much smaller amount than the, than the deflection itself. And that motion, of course, is linear. So we take the earlier, later, and then do the, uh, that's a linear motion, and then we see the deflection on top of this, you, to which, what is the deflection? Um, so we do that for all the stars, 26 stars in that, and see all the stars, so the, 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 a consistent, self-consistent solution we do, and make sure that we got the proper motions of all right, and then ex on top of what is the, actually the deflection, that, that we, that's what we measure. Okay, I have a comment um, and a question. Comment for uh, Kailash is that, and for everybody really, is that uh, the relevance to solar eclipses is not just because it's similar to what Eddington did, which is famous, but also because there's actually a citizen science project uh, involved with the upcoming eclipse for ordinary people, at least amateur astronomers as far as they're ordinary people, uh, to try to reproduce Eddington's experiment directly. Uh, and you know, there's some hope that with modern equipment, CCD cameras on high resolution telescopes, that we'll be able to do better than Eddington and get closer to that 1.75, but who knows. Uh, but it's the first opportunity in a long time to have a lot of people looking at the solar eclipse, um, you know, over a very large area, uh, and it's in a pretty rich star field. Then my question is for Brian. Um, another uh, visualization tool that the American Astronomical Society in particular has been pushing lately um, is the Worldwide Telescope. And I'm wondering uh, the degree to which Blender and the data visualization that you're doing uh, has been or can be 
poured into uh, Worldwide Telescope or vice versa, um, one of the motivations there is that it's a, a way of linking visualizations directly to published papers and things like that. And since you've, your book is published by IOP, IOP also publishes our journals. Uh, so I'm just wondering to the, de the degree to which you've talked about that. That's, um, so that's a great question. One of the nice features of Worldwide Telescope is uh, kind of the tour feature mm -hmm. and being able to narrate and go through you know, whatever, whatever story that you want to tell with your data visualization and with your science. So I think linking um, the, the mobile device um, application that I showed with Blender, with Worldwide Telescope, and things like all sky maps or transient events, mm -hmm. and being able to say, okay, look, these uh, exciting astronomical events are happening right here. You can narrate and visualize your data, I think would be a really great partnership between those two features. Mm -hmm. Great. Any other questions? All right, then with that, we'll wrap up our press conferences here. Uh, our next press conference will be on uh, Tuesday morning, January 9th at uh, 1015 Eastern Standard Time. Uh, topic's probably going to be exoplanets, but who knows, could be something else. Um, and I want to thank you all again for uh, your attendance at these briefings, thank our speakers for joining us this morning, and uh, we look forward to a lot more interesting discoveries in the months and years to come. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.